beep, beep. What is up, ninjas? My name is Samuel with Evolution of Sound, and one of you guys have sent me a song to do stem mastering on. Now, what is stem mastering? Stem mastering is the process whereby an audio engineer takes group stereo mixes from a final mix, enhances the sound, and creates a technically excellent releasable version of the track. I don't know if I'm gonna technically excellently do this today, but I'm gonna try my best and explain the stuff I'm doing in hopes that a newbie like me can help a newbie like you. So always, if you wanna support the channel, make sure to head over to evilsounds.com where you can find all of my sound design work. Okay, so I have the stem here guys so all i'm gonna do is highlight all of these gonna drag over here and i'm gonna hold command now some things to look out for when you do this is make sure that everything isn't warped because it can mess things up i have yet to check this track out so hopefully the mix is good but if it isn't good then this is where stem mastering can come really in handy Let's say you paid some dude off fiber 50 bucks to mix your track and you just weren't happy with it and he decides to mix and dash well this is where stem mastering can come into play you can get a decent stem master and we can technically fix some of the imperfections of the mix as well all right so this is gonna be my first time hearing this and as i do this i'm gonna make some mental notes before i continue this track has been supplied by freddy i like to call him the man by the river just making beats you know in my culture we have la llorona you know they hear her crying through the forest at night well over there in hand danger vida we have a llorona here i'm making beats throughout the night <laughs> thanks for sending the track bro Starts very mysterious. Definitely has the vibe of El Lloron. Mm. Okay, so that man's making my life easy because there's not a lot to stem master here. There's not a main lead. It's a very ambient track, which will have its own difficulties because we're going to see if I kill the ambience. First thing to do is it sounds like the bass doesn't have a legit decent side chain going on. It's also very clicky. So that's probably the first thing that I'm going to target. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put a side chain on this, but I want to be careful not to over side chain. Usually you can over side chain a bass, but when you have a top synth in there, that's in the middle range, uh, you don't want to get too carried away. So I'm going to go kick and I'm going to go pre effects just in case I decide to play around with the kick a bit. Um, and then from there, we're just going to side chain, increase the frequency. What this is doing is just going to allow the, the compressor to EQ the kick as it comes in. That's what's going to trigger it instead of fucking John, Pepe. We're going to move to peak mode. This, this dark green outline is the peak and then, then the super light green one you see is the RMS, which is the average level. Uh, we want to go based on peak. RMS will probably use to compress the pads a bit and we'll talk a little bit about the theory of that as well. From there, the kick feels like we can push it a bit further. So I'm gonna saturate the, the kick. Uh, I'm just gonna increase the drive a bit. And then we're gonna lower it back down. Yeah, it's a little too much, let's go around 4 dB. Now there was this article I read where some guy stated that you can literally saturate everything in the song and again, this doesn't come from me. This comes from a mixing engineer that does it for a living. And as long as you don't go heavy handed, over salted, you should be fine. And a lot of the times it does better because producers and mixing engineers tend to not saturate enough, which excites the sound. The human ear loves colored sound. From here, I'm going to get rid of the low end of this kick. I'm hearing something that I just don't like. Remember on the bass, I'm going to put an EQ and I'm going to do a bit of give and take with the kick and bass. So this is a trick I learned from John Christian a long time ago. The idea is you want to look at where your bass is at the boomiest.
So what I'm going to do is leave it like so because I think this already has a lot, but I'm going to reduce on the kick around the C1 area. Now, yes, I understand the bass is moving a lot. And for this, you would do stuff like surf EQ, etc. But for now, this works. Now, what I'm going to do is now go to the kick to the C2 range and increase just a tiny bit there. And then on the bass, I'm going to do the opposite of that. I'm also going to compress the bass, a lot of movement on the volume of it as it plays out. So for that, I'm just going to use a compressor. We'll leave the knee where it should be at. I'm scared of doing like more of a, of a hard knee, mainly because I don't want the compression to be too hurt. Now the idea of this is, is again, when it comes to a song, when you're trying to get it loud and when you're trying to get it to be played, you don't want, you want dynamics, but you don't want it to the point where it's like quiet and all of a sudden it gets loud. That's just going to make the compressor and limiter that we're going to be putting on the master of this stem master work a lot harder. Now I could try to saturate the bass further, but from the looks of the crest factor, it seems like it's already been saturated. Now, if you're wondering what that is, as you can see in Ableton, there's this light green. And then there's this dark kind of color on top of that, right? So that's the crest factor, the difference between the dark green and the light green. Now the dark green is gonna be the peak, and then the light green is gonna be the RMS. RMS is average loudness. From here, I am going to EQ this like so because there's clicks that I, I'm just not a fan of. I think it takes away from the immersion of the track. From there, let's move on to the drums. So I'm going to bring in the synths now just to see what the drums sound with them on. So there's a lack of space that you would want in these kind of tracks. And usually that will stem from not respecting the space of the sounds that you have. So obviously the kick and the bass have a lot of the low end already. But now from there, the mids, the highs, and the top, top end, the mid frequencies, it seems like they're kind of clogged. So we got to go in like a plumber and like <coughs> unclog this shit. So uh, we'll save the drums for later. Let's focus on the synths. I feel like there's some invasion of frequencies occurring here. Okay, yeah, so this is our low end. We have the dun shot uh, with the bass, so then this. Yeah, it's not no bueno, as we would say. Now, it doesn't mean you have to get rid of it fully because remember in the break, we have this sort of joron moment fretted by the river, making pads. So we can always automate something like that, so. I'm also going to filter this up for a bit. Just do him the favor, right? <laughs> We're obviously going to add a side chain to the synths. And, you know, this pad maybe should go here, but we'll leave it like that. Hopefully we can get away with it. Uh, but we are going to sidechain the whole synth group to the kick. Now, we don't need to do a heavy sidechain like before. Again, we're just going to EQ and grab the click of the kick. That's the only thing I care about when it comes to this. And just allow that to at least pop out. Peak mode. So from there... I'm going to focus on the synth group. Now, usually I recommend to EQ as you hear the song, but I do want to 
get the synth group itself to sound good. We have this pluck, which again, makes no sense why it would have so much of the fundamental frequency, which is this big Everest as mountain, you see? We're gonna get rid of it. Now, usually if you have a song and, and, and you have a bass that's sub and, and this is the only synth playing, then you wouldn't wanna do that. But in this scenario, since we have a bass that is going all the way here, we have a pad that is taking this up as well. Uh, we have like uh, drums with like some low end to it as well then it's wise to give away this on this synth but in return we can boost maybe this and reduce on the other guys to allow for this to pop out which i'm gonna first off <laughs> we're gonna use mid tight eq on this because it's it's covering a lot now down the center, I have my bass, I have uh, the pluck, I have um, little things, the guitar that happens, etc. So it's safe to say that I'm going to allow this mid part to be for other elements and I'm going to get rid of it on the pad, but it's going to remain in the side signal, which is the, the width part of the bass. For example here, that. Pad is going to get a compressor now. This is where comp I think, you know, as a, as a mixing engineer, this is where they make the big bucks because this is where taste starts to take. What are you going to allow forward? How are you going to compress? Anybody can compress, but how you do it is very important. One of the things I learned from a great mixing engineer was um, the whole idea of the knee. Before someone would say hard knee, instant, soft knee, 18 dB, slowly. But the best way someone explained it to me was for more musical things that's more gradual, like strings, pads that slowly come in and out, etc. You want a softer knee. And for drums and shit, you want to knock and you want instant compression. The moment it hits, it's like boom, instead of gradual, then you go 0, 0.0 dB. So knowing that, I'm going to go with a high knee, some attack, of course, some release, because I don't want the compression to just leave away instantly because you're going to hear a volume like Ooh, come in. And then maybe a low ratio and then just feel, put it where I feel is right. All right, so we're going to go to the drums and work on that now and for drums um let's see i might decide to put a side chain there is no clap so that's the reason why um if there was a clap then i wouldn't do this but this is the top group I'm missing a clap so can get away with this the reason is that it sounds like some of the shakers and hats are hitting with the kick but they're not respecting the kick there's no velocity change occurring on them now this open hat is suffering from some nastiness we're gonna use another eq for that just because we already messed with that and i i hate doing this over there i'm gonna reduce a bit on that if possible Uh, most open hats you can use plugins like sooth which will help you do this a lot better um but again, f from my experience, and again, this is all just experience, usually open hats can, that are harsh, <laughs> can um, benefit from these kind of cuts. I think what I'm going to do on the bass is utilize a multi-band compressor because I don't want that top part of the bass to get uh, compressed like the way we had it. It kind of kills it. I want it to still maintain in the front. And with that, I feel like it's just boom, squashing it. So this is where a multi-band compressor can come in handy. I need to separate it though. So let's see, we're going to solo this part. Okay, let's see the mid. Yeah, see, so we've separated them. So now let's focus our attention here. Again, 54, 54 ratio of let's say um negative we're gonna go one db to what four okay we're gonna bring this up now 
We're losing about 7 dB of gain reduction, so let's ease up a bit. Okay, now we have this sound. So just a tiny bit. Again, for this guy, I'm actually going to allow for more attack because I don't want to squash the sound and I want it to be boom, punchier. So we're going to increase the attack, which is how fast the compressor is going to go. So it's going to take a while. We'll leave it at around 102 and then lower this release. That sound has a wide ping pong delay. Yep, so we're gonna EQ the lows up. We'll allow some of this to stay with. You can see that we have a lot of low end, which we're gonna fix on the master. All right, guys, so my recording failed for some reason. It didn't record my voice for the last one hour and 30 minutes as I was editing. So I'm going to start off from where we were at. So the next thing we did from there was the synths weren't popping out in the track too much. So from there, I decided to utilize a bit of distortion to bring upper frequencies into the sound. A lot of the times if you have a sound and you can't go back to the synth and open it up, then you can use distortion to create upper harmonic frequencies. Uh, usually they'll sound good. They're not going to sound as good as opening the saw, but you can still make it work. So for this, we use the Ableton Overdrive. From there, a bit of erosion to give this sound a little more air. And finally, one last EQ cutting out the lows because whenever you have any form of distortion or erosion, uh, you want to do a low pass because sometimes, again, distortion, saturation, erosion, anything that modulates like this will bring in low frequencies that you don't want. And while it might be very minuscule, it's the little things that prevent you from getting loud. From there, we also put a bit of erosion on the pad to give it more of a grainy feel. That Finally, we went over to the drums where we saturated them in the group and we also glue compressed them together. Now, the reason for the glue compressor and the saturator is just to make the drums go through a similar chain, which will make them feel um, as one. If you're ever wondering how do you get your drums to glue together, a lot of the times just putting the same reverb or the same delay slight on drums can make them feel like they're in the same room, in essence, gluing the drums. So for here, we use the saturator. followed by a glue compressor. The glue compressor is set to 30 milliseconds, so it allows the initial part of the open hat or whatever is triggering it to pass through before it starts to reduce volume. And then from there, a very fast release because we don't need a long release for something like this because, again, the compressor doesn't need to latch on. It's not like we're processing like a vocal or a pad that slowly comes in and out. Um, a bit of EQ here to remove that da, 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 da part of the sound because again we have too much stuff going on on this drop very ambient so we need to make room for everything okay now from here this is where the magic happens because now we finally do the master master that most of you guys will do um in your tracks which will be on the master channel inside of ableton now um the first thing in the in the chain will be the saturator set to soft sign the reason for that is that it's been proven already, someone made a video about this, that the Sonox inflator is literally just the Ableton soft sign like this by default. That's all it is. So putting it on gives us that nice lift. That's all you need to do. If you want to get specific to how it sounds, just lower the output by about negative 0.86. Now, this is the iffy part of this master because I rarely will do this with certain tracks, but this one needed it. Now, in this one, you're going to notice there's this 
noobish looking EQ at the bottom end here, which is removing and rolling off um, any everything below 153 to an extent. Now, the reason for this is, again, something happened during the kick and bass processing with the producer side uh, on the producer side that where maybe they did like a low end boost. Maybe it was a mixing engineer. Um, that just doesn't make sense with all the tracks out there. The Boris Brecher track, Steve Legger, etc. This track is just way, way, way too boomy. It makes everything feel like it's in the back of the mix. So this needed uh, this reducement. Now, the reason we go with a low shelf and then get more specific, um, it's just vibes. You, you, you try out different things. I, I targeted a little bit more of the fundamental, the, the root note. Uh, and then from there, everything below with a low shelf instead of a, of a, of a low cut. Just again, reducing uh, phase issues, but I also like the way that it looks, the way that it does it gradually coming from here all the way down instead of like straight, just, okay, you're cutting everything below a certain amount. I wanted it gradual versus instant. From there, the multiband dynamics, I did want to show you guys the thought process behind using it. So I'll try my best to kind of recreate what, what went down. Uh, no, we don't want to get rid of that one because I really like the settings on that. Uh, but the idea is we're going to set first off our low and high frequency so that way we can solo and listen to the low end response first. We have the bass and then we have the kick. This is what's going to cover this low end part. Now, I do feel like the kick it was a bit too poof, boom versus the bass. So then that's where we come in with um, this guy. So by pulling down here, we're increasing the ratio, how hard we're compressing. You can see we're already getting net of negative 4.0, negative 4.5 gain reduction. Let's ease up on that a bit. And from there, we're going to make up some of it. So we're going to turn it off and on. Okay. From there on our mitts, um, from there, our attack. So 18.9 and 73.6. So we don't really... We aren't really trying to preserve too much of the punch down there because again, we want a little bit more stable. We don't want the rumble in the speakers. From there, the settings of the compressor, the attack and release are set somewhat low, very fast attack, instant almost. And then from there, some release just to not have it do go fast and create clicks. Just a bit more stable. The, the low end bass will pop out more while the kick gets sort of pushed into it. From there, the mids. What I wanted here was the kick to glue in a little better. Let's make it up. And then the highs again, same thing. This one gets a little bit higher attack just because I want to preserve as much as I can that the open hat. You can overdo it too if you want. From there, we use span to increase and add pleasant frequencies. Now, sadly, again, the issue with this track is that, that it's just way too boomy. There's so much low end that we have to bring up a lot of the elements like our mids and highs. So that's why this is for the CQ8 here. And finally, from there, we utilize a glue compressor with the soft clip on in order to get loud. From here, I'm utilizing this loves here, and I'm trying to get to around 8 dB, or sorry, 8 loves, negative 8. Okay, so the last thing we're going to do is just compare both and see the differences of the master. Now, in order to not make loudness be a factor in this, I'm going to use the utility at the end of the mastering chain at negative 6, so that way... Uh, we're going to both be equally at negative 60B. 
and then from there just kind of input the differences so I'm gonna just line this up and go from there so we're gonna go with the OG now this is not running through my mastering chain I have it set to external out okay so we added a bit of grain on ours and then his doesn't have it that's more of a subjective thing Okay, ours is just a little bit more forward. Here we go. Let's hear it one more time. So obviously on his, the pad is just too overwhelming. On ours, we had to do this sort of gain reduction on the pad. But one of the biggest things I see with pads is that if you don't process them properly or you, them, or you let them take control of your track like this and run all over you, it kills all sort of um, movement. Like for instance, in his, the bass isn't grooving. It's not creating a factor. It doesn't have the impact. Versus here, the bass is in our face with the kick and the pad surrounds it. Here the open hat comes in, but it doesn't have the space to shine like it should. He doesn't have that. I added it myself by distorting one of the last things at the end. Okay, so a couple of notes that I would make for the master that I'm working on. Personally, me, um, open hat might be a bit too much. Uh, so I would look at what's causing that, maybe uh, too much saturation. Um, from there, the other thing too was, um, I think that's about it. Maybe the kick is rather clicky, but comparing it to some Stevie Legger tracks, uh, it sounds almost up there with it. Uh, maybe a Foley shot with the kick would have been better, a better kick. Uh, from there, there's really not much else to say other than the fact that from here, you can also get into the creative side of mastering. So to give you guys an example, there's this great plugin called Taup Tape um, that I personally like to use when I'm mixing stuff, depending on what I'm trying to do. So for this instance, this one adds flavor in ways where I used to think was wrong, but now it's sort of cool because, for example, let's say that I want to master where, I don't know, um, I want it to sound sort of old school, then I could use some of the, one of these. For example... It changes the tone, right? Like it adds that lowness, some certain flavor, which some tracks will benefit and others won't. I'm trying to find like a good one. Oh, here you go. This is more warmer, not as many highs. More intimate. So again, it, um, when it comes to mastering, I, I feel like if you are doing, giving a clean product, it's hitting like it should, everything has space and you're, you've done a good job from there. It's subjective. Certain people might say, oh, you need less highs, etc." And again, uh, you start getting more into like the creative side of it, which, you know, it's a new realm. Once you master uh, getting tracks to sound clean, now you're seeking how to get them dirty in a good way. Other than that, guys, if you guys enjoyed the video, learned anything in it, consider subscribing, hit like, leave a comment. And if you want to support my channel, head over to evilsounds.com. You can find all of my sound design work. My sound banks are used by some of the top producers like Lost Frequencies, James Hype, West End, Umix, Space 92. Uh, the list goes on. But other than that, you guys take care and you guys have a great rest of your day.